Now for my favorite part of the morning. And that's introducing Tim Campbell for our program this morning. He and I go way back, which you'll hear about in a moment, very briefly. But this morning's speaker, Tim Campbell, of Studio Tim Campbell, Los Angeles and New York. He, I just love Tim. It looks like he's an overnight success. He's under the radar. He's renovated some of the most extraordinary homes in Los Angeles. If you don't know his name, that means nothing. He is absolutely extraordinary what he does. And as I say, his overnight sensation, it actually took 25 years. And he's in a wonderful spot, and deservedly so. The passion, the dedication, the knowledge, it's all there. And I know you're going to see that and sense that instantly when he begins to speak. He is an architectural designer. Basically, he restores, renovates, and updates prime architectural homes. And for the John Arrow folks, if you remember Ed Lomato's home in Colmar Canyon, Tim is now renovating that for a client. Tim and his office has a wonderful crew of six based here in Los Angeles and more crew in New York. They're currently renovating 10 homes for the typical, you know, mobile group, including many homes and projects for Diane and Keaton, and you're all aware that she's a wonderful preservationist. He oversees, as I said, a staff of six, spends one week a month at his New York office, and in addition to projects between New York and LA, he's also hit Paris and Mexico City. So in a moment, Tim's going to be speaking. You're in for a real treat. And when he comes up, you're going to ask me later, who's he wearing? <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's Tom Brown Couture. <laughs> and with that, please welcome Tim Campbell. It's a lot to live up to. It's great to see so many friendly faces in the crowd. It's a little nerve wracking to it. So many of you may not know this, but Brett and I may have one of the longest running friendships in Los Angeles. Uh, we met back in 1986 on Detroit Street in the We both lived in this quaint neighborhood, and if you've lived in LA for a while, you probably know what I'm talking about. Two story apartment buildings on the other side of the street, each styled in a different architectural genre. The mostly center hallway buildings and basically stucco boxes. But you'll see a stucco box with a Tudor facade, or a stucco box with a French Normandy facade, or a stucco box with a Mission Revival facade. Most of them were designed by Hollywood set designers in the 1930s. I was most likely walking my pugs, and me being a little shy, true. Uh, it was most likely Brett who started that conversation. We had a shared love of our neighborhood, and that became the basis of our friendship. Over the years, I watched Brett's career grow. Uh, he has an extraordinary, almost savant-like knowledge of LA's architectural residential, residential architectural history. And besides that, he's just a really sweet guy. So, Brett, thank you. It's been an honor uh, to be your friend and watch your career grow. And thank you for asking me to be here today. So there I was on Detroit Street in 1986. And here I am standing in front of you today in 2012. The journey from there to here has been pretty amazing. It's brought me to people and places in a career um, that I know I never imagined when I was growing up in West Virginia. Not a lot of interior designers and architects were walking the streets of Hartford, West Virginia when I was a <laughs> But that's where my earliest memories of design were rooted. And that's where at the age of seven, I discovered a magazine that would change my life. It was 1976. And I spent a lot of time foraging these old junk shops that dotted the Ohio River. These junk shops were once these grand old houses that were now relegated to humble warehouses, collecting used furniture, old paintings, and farm equipment. As a boy, I'd spend hours on end rummaging through these old buildings, inhaling the musty scents, making up stories in my mind about the people who owned the things that I was looking at, old chairs and broken arm walls, torn rugs and dusty mirrors, I'd notice how the light was pouring in through the broken windows on the second floor, and I'd also listen to how the floors would creak and moan when I walked across them. Now, it should speak volumes to you that while my friends were trying to steal a copy of Hustler or Playboy from the little Piggly Wiggly, <laughs> I was obsessed with these artifacts of lives past in these old junk shops. And one day on one of these scavenger trips, I came across a stack of magazines 
topped off by the latest issue of Gunning Bar Magazine or something like that. And to the doubters among you, that is a real magazine. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I did. I couldn't believe what I was holding in my hands. I couldn't believe that anything like this existed in the world. Page after page, the French apartments, the pied de in New York, and a Cape Dutch colonial in Montecito, California, which seemed like a world away at that time, I realized that I had found something very profound. And for a seven-year-old gay boy in a one-church town, I had. I had found my Ten Commandments. I had found a magazine that changed my life, Architectural Digest. And from that day, and every day since, pictures were my words. I'd already had a natural love for drawing, and with this magazine, I studied every photograph and sketched every floor plan and absorbed every detail of every room. And while my life has grown and changed in a lot of ways, in other ways, it hasn't changed at all. Over all these years in LA, I still love to draw. I still love sketching floor plans. And I'm still absorbed in every detail of every house that I'm working on. Looking back, it seems my childhood passion for design has never waned, not one little bit. And neither is my passion for all things beautiful. In fact, in all respects, it's grown. And I guess that's what happens when you get lucky, like I did, and your passion grows into your life's work. Now, my early career was focused on helping other designers and architects bring pro their projects to fruition by producing their construction drawings for them. So these floor plans I was obsessed with drawing back then, as a boy, well, that skill really came in handy in my early career. Along the way, people mentored me and helped me to develop my own design philosophy. My two greatest mentors, the two men whose voices I hear in my mind whenever I go out and meet with new clients and look at new homes, were Eli Martin Long and O. Douglas Phillips. Martin was a well-known preservation architect. He taught me to listen to the building, the way that light falls, the way rooms are ordered and proportioned. Martin had a great appreciation for the past. From Martin, I learned to find the character of the building. The other voice I hear in my mind is O. Douglas Phillips. Like me, Doug was self-trained. Doug loved order, balance, and symmetry. He adored all the classics. And Doug had an attitude about architecture, and he taught me to have one too when it was required to make a point about your design intention. Gradually, though, my focus shifted from other people's projects to my own. And 10 years ago, I found my own design office, Studio 10 Camel. We are a residential and commercial design firm based in Los Angeles and New York. And we have both an architectural and an interior division. In that short time, I've earned some pretty significant commissions. First of these was a Colony Palms Hotel in Palm Springs. This is a historically significant property, which was built in the 1920s. I'm working with a licensed structural engineer. I designed renovations and additions to the hotel. Many of you may know it from its checkered past life. It was formerly known as the Howard Manor, a notorious gangster hangout in the 1930s. <laughs> Next was Richard Wentry's Singleton House. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. After that was a home I was hired to redesign, a run of fountain credited to Luis Barrera. And I'll also be talking about that a little bit later as well. Following that was the Ralph Llewellyn House, for which I received an award from the City of Beverly Hills Design Review Commission in 2007. After that, I'm going to write. And to my favorite project to date, a uh, home designed by Rex Lowry in Beverly Hills. More on some of those houses soon, and I promise I'll get back to them, because I know if it came down to it, most of you would want to spend time in the Neutron House or looking at the work of Louis Barragan. But I also know that a large number of you are villagers. And I also know there are matters of building code that are important to you and your clients. And I want to speak to some of those too. So let's put the houses on hold for a moment. Well, I tell you this. I look at houses all the time for my clients with agents. And I'm aware of the challenges of creating upside potential in this market. And like you, I'm aware of the complexity of the building code. And when it comes to neighborhood councils, planning commissions, design review boards, hillside ordinance, baseline managementization ordinance, Believe me, I feel your pain. <laughs> and I sense it when I'm looking at these houses for clients, and I hear the questions from agents. How much square footage can my client have? Can I add over there? And what is the cyber setback? 
These are all important questions that will often shape projects in fundamental ways. And since a lot of my business is driven by providing free consultations to agents like yourselves, I want you to know that if you want to talk about a specific project, a specific client, or even your favorite building code section, <laughs> please feel free to contact me after the talk, and more importantly, make sure that Brad has your card. But for now, for today, and since my talk is about pedigreed properties and how to make them relevant in today's market, I want to share with you my design philosophy, which really comes down to four design mantras that I use to guide my work. These are four very simple mantras I use when going about renovating, restoring, or adding on to pedigree properties. And these mantras apply to all houses, architecturally significant and otherwise. And they are, number one, respect the work of the original architect. Number two, listen to the house. Number three, honor the site and the surrounding landscape. And number four, know your audience. You know, whenever I'm able to use these mantras in my work, I really believe that these buildings that have basically become unlivable by today's standards and irrelevant because we just can't live in them anymore, we give them a whole new life and they become relevant again. When many of these pedigree homes were conceived, I think their architects were looking to create a more contemporary way of living. <laughs> After all, the middle of the last century was a time of fundamental shifts in America and abroad. We completely reconsidered how we lived, and for their time, these houses were contemporary. And while they were radical then, they were designed for that time and the needs of that particular time. But needs change. Today, we live quite differently than America lived in the middle of the last century. Lifestyles are different. Families are different. Technology is different. And so for these houses to actually remain contemporary, they must be changed, sometimes radically and sometimes not. Because allowing them to evolve is actually what's going to ensure that they survive. Keeping them as a museum, museum serves no purpose, but making them viable by today's standards adds value. So when I'm looking at a pedigree property, how do I approach them? I'm asked that a lot, and I realize I usually start here for a few reasons. The first is that the European model for the renovation of historic structures is different. The second is that Europeans generally have a more evolved sense of restoration than Americans do. The third speaks to history. They've been around longer, so they have a lot more of these buildings to work with. That brings me to my next point. Europeans, they just have a lot more experience in this area than we do. And finally, when you add together history plus experience, what you get is a greater appreciation for the old. And I see that whenever I'm in Europe. And there's something about that that I find incredibly comforting and at the same time really, really exhilarating. And so I thought a lot about it and I often ask myself, how is their approach different? Well, as realtors, I think you'll understand and, and really appreciate what I'm about to say, which is that I think Europeans have actually made a beautiful science dealing with their pedigree properties and they do it in a few ways. By keeping as much of the exterior of the building as is possible, by renovating the, the interior of the building as much as, as is necessary to make it viable lot for today's needs, by adding all of the necessary comforts, and by preserving the exterior of the building. Impressive, isn't it? How they streamlined the process and made it work so well for them that it actually adds value to their own pedigree properties. I believe so strongly in this approach that I've co-opted it and I now use it in my own practice. So how do I employ this approach to my work? This is where my four mantras come into play. Remember them? One, respect the work of the original architect. Two, listen to the house. Three, honor the site and the surrounding landscape. And four, know your audience. In order to illustrate what I mean by this, I'd like to tell you about four of my recent Westside projects. Now, the first is a Baragon residence completed in 2006 in Holby Hills. It's a 5,000 square foot courtyard house. So this is a 5,000 square foot house. It's a courtyard house built around a fountain, credited to Luis Barragan and recognized as a cultural monument in the city of Los Angeles. The original house was purchased in the 1970s by Douglas Campbell. Douglas Campbell is no relationship to me, But he was a commodities broker between the US and Mexico, and he was enamored of Barragan's work. After a trip to Mexico, he asked an LA land 
landscape designer to design a fountain for him in his courtyard house that would reflect the work of Luis Barragán. The landscape designer asked him a very important question. He said, why don't you ask Barragán to design the fountain? He did, so Barragán designed the fountain. Now let me tell you about the house that I encountered. The original house was a haphazard uh, mess of a building. It's an architectural goulash with no point of view. It had a lot of stylistic flourishes, but no traffic flow. So obviously there needed to be a design solution, and the one I came up with speaks to my first design mantra. It was to design a building that would respect the work of the original architect, in this case, Luis Barragán. And, and so the new building needed to support his, his fountain, stand in its shadow, and be respectful of the fountain. How did I attempt to do that? First was to design the building and the geometry used by Barragán in many of his residential projects in Mexico City. Second was to create positive and negative spaces using that geometry. And third was to use a similar texture to the stucco that Barragán used on many of his Mexico City houses. Now most of you probably associate Barragán with his brightly colored houses, yellows, pinks, and oranges. But I wanted to render the entire building in white so that it could recede, stand back, and not call attention to itself, but rather allow the original orange cantarison fountain to be the star. You know, there's a controversial backstory to this house and the fountain, and that is that Barragán died when the fountain was under construction, and because of that, the Barragán Foundation in Switzerland uh, never officially recognized the work as that of Luis Barragán, even though it is recognized as a cultural monument in the city of Los Angeles. So when we completed the house, the other Times approached me about doing a story of it. And in writing the story, the controversy surrounding the provenance of the fountain became apparent. The photographs that you're seeing here, taken for me by Julia Schoen, present the foremost expert on Barragán in Texas. The expert rendered his opinion, and that was that while he felt, felt that the fountain may or may not have been the work of Barragán, the house certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, after much review, the Barragán Foundation in Switzerland uh, made the determination that the fountain is, in fact, a work of Barragán. Respect the work of the original architect and honor his or her intention of that work. So now let's look at the second mantra that I use. Listen to the house. The house will speak to you. You know how to listen. I want to show you how that's incorporated into the Neutra House I work in in 2006. I'm sure many of you know that Richard Neutra is one of the most well-known mid-century architects of his time. He had an uncanny eye for simplicity and reduction and a great appreciation for nature. And these two things meant that his buildings erased the lines between the interior spaces and the exterior spaces, <coughs> melding these dark minimal, these stark minimal buildings with the surrounding landscape. His Singleton House in Los Angeles is easily one of the most recognizable structures of that era, and it's quintessentially Neutra. Ronnie and Vidal Sassoon purchased the property. Now before I go on, I do want to acknowledge Vidal's passing last Wednesday. He was a rare man. He was uh, the quintessential English gentleman. He's kind and considerate and generous. It was an extraordinary honor to work on this house with him. And we will all miss him very much. When we began to work on it, however, it was in a terrible state of disrepair, which, by the way, did not deter the Sassoons. Let me give you a short version of the long weekend repair list for the Singleton House. There was no heater air conditioning in the house. The interiors were run down and worn from years of use and neglect. The pool was cracked and leaky. And as if that wasn't discouraging enough, Shortly after the Sassanians purchased the property, El Nino met. And there was a rainstorm of biblical proportions, and Ronnie and Vidal discovered that a tree branch had fallen through the roof of the house. And then to add to that already long list of problems, on a remote part of the property, which is five acres, part of the hillside gave way and slid down towards Mall. In short, the house didn't look good, so the Sassoons didn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at this point, the story would really be seemingly going in a very obvious direction, right? The owners would sell the property to the highest bidder. That would no doubt be the developer. And shortly thereafter, 
Five lovely early American French Spanish Tudor mansions, all one, with lives in the earth. It didn't happen. Not this time. And not this house. Because Ronnie and Vidal were undaunted. We decided to listen to the house and let it tell us what it could be. Now, I realize that this sounds a little bit like Shirley McLean and Out on the Wind. <laughs> there were no seances, and I can assure you that I'm the last guy to be found at the now defunct Bloody Tree doing past that progressions. But with respect to buildings, I have no doubt. When you spend enough time in them, and you listen with your eyes, you start to see how the light falls. Nice in the space and on the side. When you listen with your skin, you start feeling where the breezes come from and how they change throughout the day. When you listen with your heart, you sense the signature characteristics of the architecture and you learn what elements play louder and what elements play softer. So we listened, and this is what we heard. So now I try to use steel casement windows the exterior of the building in order to establish a rhythm to the exterior of the building. We decided we would not disturb that rhythm. He also used large sliding glass doors combined with duct jointed corner glass windows to create expansive views of the exterior. He used jealousy windows in places to allow for the influx of cool air on warm evenings. He used white terrazzo floors throughout the house. And he mixed liberally maple and wall and wood veneers throughout the house. All of those elements we kept. Now let's take a look at what we didn't keep, and what wasn't working, and so it had to change, and how this house became a living example of what I mentioned before. For these houses to remain contemporary, they must be changed, because allowing them to evolve is what's going to ensure that they survive. Okay, let's take a look at the interior spaces. They were totally not contemporary by, today, by today's living standards. Bedrooms were tiny and unusable, no mechanicals were working in the house. Bathrooms were tiny and inefficient. The kitchen was small and utilitarian. So as with the Barragon house, there needed to be a design solution. And the one I came up with speaks to my second design mantra. Listen to the house. The house will tell you what it needs to be. The new interior plan called for a gracious master suite. The kitchen was moved from the north side of the house to the south side of the house by combining several small bedrooms. A family room was created out of the leftover space. The original built-in bar was recreated in the master sitting room. The existing pool was rebuilt exactly as it was. Wood veneers were matched in color, texture, and finish. And finally, energy efficient heat and air conditioning were installed. So we listened to the house. It had all the words we needed to use. And we used those words softly and respectfully. And because we listened, I think we saved a very spe special, very wonderful house for another hundred years. It had once again become contemporary. For me, the final word was in a letter sent to me by Julius Schulman after he saw the house after his, complete, after his completion. To paraphrase him here, he said, if Neutra had listened to his client, as you did yours when you reworked the house, he might have realized a better house. Now, to be clear, Schulman was speaking from a functional standpoint. Because without a doubt, the house was a masterpiece and is a masterpiece. But from a functional standpoint, he was speaking to Neutra's rather efficient manner in which he expected all of his clients to live. Listen to the house. The house will speak to you if you know how to listen. The third mantra I use when I take a cut of you home and make it relevant in today's marketplace is to honor the sight and surrounding landscape. Now, I know it sounds a little bit like a no-brainer, but later on today, when you leave, when you leave this building and you look up at the hills from just outside the PDC, and you see those hillsides dotted with buildings put upon, cantilevered out over sometimes near vertical hillsides, ask yourself, are we really honoring the site and surrounding landscape? And I know, I know this is a result in most cases of topography and also of rather insensitive building codes. And finally, it's a, about the desire to maximize rather difficult parcels of land. And I know we're not unusual in this respect because many, many cities have evolved this way. But I also know that Neutra, Barragon, and most other modernist architects really did show a respect, a deep respect, for the site in ways that we don't often see in today's contemporary architecture. One of those other modernist architects was Rex Lottery. To me, Rex Lottery is one of the unsung architectural heroes of his era. 
He showed such a sublime understanding of the site in one of my most recent projects, a home in Beverly Hills he designed, which we are currently working on. This is without a doubt one of my favorite projects to date. My clients who work in the fashion industry fell in love with the sweeping pavilion roof and the way the house reclines across the landscape. The one-story house is characterized by large expanses of glass with unobstructed views of the five acres upon which it sits. Clear story windows are on nearly every plane of the building, topped by a large pavilion roof that float above, that, that float above those windows. <coughs> Plan of the house runs in two axes. In the primary pavilion, which is sighted to greet visitors and impress upon them the stature of the house, Lowry located what he referred to as an adult playroom, which included a bar. This is exactly the kind of house where you'd expect to see Peggy Lee and Bing Crosby sipping drinks at that bar. Those were the things that my client loved about the house. And while it was contemporary for its time, its kitchen was small and service oriented. The original master bath had been replaced with an odd addition. It had a carport instead of a garage, and it lacked sufficient staff quarters for a house of its size. So again, making it relevant in today's market meant adding the services and utilities to keep it relevant. Relevancy is what keeps these properties alive, and it keeps them evolving and surviving. The site of this house, however, is a bowl, um, and the only place to be <coughs> square footage was in place of the existing carport. So like the Neutra House and the Baragon House, a design solution is required. And this one speaks to my third design mantra, honor the site and the surrounding landscape. So our solution was to go underground. By going below the existing footprint with a new basement for parking and other services, we kept the original vocabulary or character-defining qualities of the house intact. The site remains largely the same, and the landscape remains largely untouched. Now, is this the cheapest way to add on to this house? Mm -hmm. It certainly is not. Basements are expens expensive to build, and second floors, by comparison, are not. However, a second floor in this house would radically alter the words used by Lowry when he wrote the story of this house. Sometimes the easy way is not the best way. So, in lieu of the existing carport, we added a new small pavilion with the basement below. It's set back from the primary pavilion, which houses Lowry's, Lowry's and all playroom, and it's articulated not in floor-to-ceiling glass as the primary pavilion, but by replicating the clear story windows featured elsewhere in the house. The new addition doesn't upstage the primary pavilion because it has a smaller footprint above ground and because most of the addition is below ground. The design vocabulary for the, for the addition is identical to that used by Lowry. I wanted to use the same words he used, but I wanted to speak softly. Honor the site and the surrounding landscape. The fourth and final mantra I'd like to talk about is to know your audience and design for their needs. And to illustrate this, I'd like to veer off course for a minute and talk to you about one of my favorite architects, Paul Williams. Now, I know that it may surprise you that he'd be one of my favorite architects, considering that everybody I talk today about today is a modern master. But Paul Williams was a very contemporary man, even though most of his work was not. He was an African-American <coughs> architect in a time when he was not allowed to sit on the same side of the table as his white clients. He worked in the rarefied world of Hollywood. He managed to cross social and class divides that were impenetrable to most others in his time. Yet Paul Williams designed buildings for a world to which he was not an invited guest. And he still managed to design them perfectly for needs and lifestyles to which he was not exposed. Williams was an outsider. And yet his understanding of his clients' needs has withstood the test of time, as his homes remain functional, desirable, and beautiful. Mr. Williams knew his clients. Now, in a lot of ways, I'm guessing that most of us in this room in the profession of real estate design are visitors in our own clients' world as well. However, because of television and travel and technology and a more permissive society, we know for the most part how our clients live. So to illustrate my fourth mantra, the last project I'd like to talk to you about is a home designed by John Myers in Beverly Hills in the 1920s. And again, it goes to my last mantra. Know your audience and be mindful of their needs. It's a Tudor home sited on several acres just above Sunset. The original house was four bedrooms and three bathrooms on three levels. It has a service kitchen and an unused basement except for an oddly placed family room. My client is a 
as a TV producer with a very busy professional and personal life. And because of time constraints on the project, the original footprint of the house couldn't be changed. And the functional aspects of the house were clearly not functional, not at least by today's standards. There was a warrant of small rooms which occupied the back side of the house adjacent to the kitchen. The kitchen, although apparently intended to be designed in good taste, reflected an aesthetic minister to a Home Depot shopping spree. <laughs> yeah, and as a tutor by nature, the interiors were dark and foreboding. Once again, a design solution was required, and this time it went to my fourth mantra, know your clients and design for their needs. So I combined several small rooms to create a family room adjacent to the kitchen. I replaced the Home Depot kitchen with our version of an English work kitchen, which included a walk-in refrigerator. And I gleefully removed all of the criminal marks on marble, covering all planes of the master bathroom, and replaced them with custom glass tippy tops from Waterworks. I opened the dining room view through to the family room, which gave it views to the lush garden in the backyard. Functionally and aesthetically, the house now meets my client's needs. By being mindful of our client's needs and designing for them, I believe we managed to preserve another piece of Los Angeles's architectural heritage. Know your audience and design for their needs. So these are the four design mantras I use when approaching a home with a certain pedigree. I'll repeat them. Respect, respect the work of the original architect and honor his or her intention with that work. Listen to the house. The house will tell you what it can be if you listen. Honor the site and the surrounding landscape. And know your audience and design for their needs. While well, all of this may seem to some as a no-brainer, I found that so much of this comes out of setting your intention from the outset. And while it may have set a few to alter the interiors, and sometimes the exteriors of these homes, isn't it more important to save these remarkable homes and make them function for today? Because allowing them to evolve is actually what's going to ensure that they survive. Because really, what purpose does it do to freeze them in time Is it for me? <laughs> because really, what purpose does it uh, does it serve to freeze these buildings in time? As reliquaries of a bygone era. If you were to ask me, I'd say no purpose, none whatsoever. Because to me, houses are to be lived in and to be enjoyed. And their walls are built so that we can build our lives within them. So I'd like to conclude with two things, and I promise I'm wrapping up. First, I'm often asked what inspires me. Travel, and that's my last six months. <laughs> Fashion, travel, art, travel, travel, travel. You can see that travel is great for me. And of all the places I've been to, Africa is the place that's dearest to my heart. It's a place that quiets my soul more than any other. It seems to reach me and touch me, to occupy my mind, and ways to go to the core of my being. Before my last trip, I set out the intention of finding a way to get back to this place that has given me so much. So, there I was in Safari in South Africa with our <coughs> crowd who guides me and my husband Steve on our annual Christmas safari. We drove past a village that we visited a few years back. And in talking to Trevor, the need for a village library became apparent. We found out how much money it cost to build a library in South Africa. In short order, Steve and I decided that we would pay for the construction of the library. Now, when I got back to LA and I talked to my team, I called them my kids because I'm old enough to be their dad, <laughs> what we had done. They wanted to do their part. So we organized a tour of a few of the houses that we've talked about today, and we'll be offering that to a maximum of 30 people. If you'd like to, we're going to have to raise funds to buy, to buy books and computers for the library. So if you'd like to see some of these houses, see me afterwards, and I'll tell you how you can participate. Uh, and if you'd like to help, but you can't join on the tour, see me as well, or give your card to Brett, and I'll be happy to share with you uh, how you can contribute to the purchase of books and computers for the school. And I want to thank you in advance for uh, your desire to participate and be a part of something that means so much to me. So I'm going to end with a final story. One that shows how wonderful it really is when you, know, when you notice how life really moves in a full circle. And it happened to me very recently. 
I'd been looking for a house for a client for several years when I noticed that a house I first visited with Brett in 1988 was on the market in Montecito. It was a beautiful Cape Dutch colonial. My client fell in love with it, bought it, and the rest. It's another happy tale of another pedigree property, perhaps for another time, but just a week ago. I visited this house and I saw something there that gave me pause. Sitting on a shelf in a beautiful library in this magnificent hall, and not in a dusty shoebox on top of a back issue of Guns and Gardens magazine this time, was an issue of Architectural Digest from 1976. Sometimes inspiration really does come full circle. And while sometimes inspiration does take years to go full circle, other times it just takes 30 minutes, like this morning. Because in, really, in reality, couldn't my four design mantras apply to you? I think so. I think if you switch the word designer for realtor, I think it will become clear to you how connected our two worlds are. Thank you.